when you talk about um, your relationship with Congress, because mm -hmm. I think there has been, I remember years ago reading the book, I think everything you should know you learned in kindergarten, and I think the first that. thing was is playing well with others. Yeah. And I don't think Congress has learned that skill of playing well with others. And I, so you run into the problem of balancing the ideologues and the practical realities, and how would you do that in Congress? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question, Kate, and it's something I think we're talking about the priorities I sent you. My fourth priority was figuring out a way to restore trust with Congress, because right now, con congressional, right now, their approval rating is incredibly low. And, and that's sad to me, because it wasn't, it wasn't intended to be that way. The Founding Fathers didn't you know, want to have some sort of monolithic that was in Washington that no one liked. <coughs> and that these people are supposed to be us, and they're supposed to be representatives of us. And it's, it, so I, I think the way you do it is you, you do work across the aisle if you have to. Um, when I was a staff member, I worked with my Democratic counterparts frequently. I didn't agree with them frequently, but we worked together because we had to, because that's what you have to do to make the process work. And I think you have to put America first. You don't, you don't sacrifice your ideas, but you have to put America first and understand what's important. And Congress doesn't have much it has to do, but it does have some things it has to do. And, and the process right now is broken, so the things that we have to do, that Congress has to do, is aren't even getting done. So, so there needs to be a realization that the process is broken, and there need to be what I think is leaders in Congress, people who are willing to, to advocate and to push the ball forward. And, and that's, I, I look at my old boss, I look at Paul Ryan, he's, he's very good at that. Um, he didn't agree with the uh, Democratic counterparts, but they, they were able to work forward, and, and we, we did. I mean, the, the House is the only, the only organization that's had a budget these last couple of years. And actually, constitutionally, I think that's the only job Congress has to do. Well, um, has the, to do. The, the appropriations bills are pretty much, so, some authorizations and then the, the appropriations bills just sort of to keep the lights on. Excellent. Uh, with regard to this issue of trust, uh, the issue of um, pledges has come up quite a bit mm -hmm. in these congressional campaigns. Have you signed or, or affirmed any pledges such as the Grover Norquist pledge have, or others? And tell us why. Yeah, I have. And that's a good question. And that comes up a lot in forums. Um, people have made uh, Grover Norquist out to be the, the boogeyman. And, you know, whether he is or isn't, I, I can't speak to. Uh, but, but the pledge that, that Grover asks people to sign says, you know, I will not raise new taxes on people. And I will not raise new taxes on people. I've worked in Washington long enough with the numbers I know them intimately, and I know that we do not have a revenue problem in this country. I don't need more revenue. What I need to do is I need to cut spending, and there's many ways to cut spending, and we really have to focus on that. Right now, the way to raise revenue, and it's always been this way, is you have to get the economy humming again. Whenever the economy is growing, whenever GDP growth is high, revenues come in, and they come in very well. When GDP growth is low, revenues go away. So what you need to do is focus on policies, and tax policies also, that encourage, uh, that encourage GDP growth. Is there a risk that you're tying your own hands by, by affirming these pledges, much like uh, President Bush did, President George H.W. Bush did? I, I don't think so, because I think that um, I support tax reform, and I think, you know, in, in my perfect world, and, and if, I'm, if I'm elected, I will certainly fight for it, and I think it was my, my second or third priority with, with uh, what I signed for the news press, um, tax reform has to happen. It absolutely has to happen, and as part of that, there are going to be some winners and losers um, in the tax code. But what we need to do, what I what I favor is what was in the Republican budget, which is where you take take the base, you get rid of the loopholes, and you, you broaden the base, but you lower the rates. And so some people are going to end up paying more taxes, but do I I wouldn't consider that a tax raise. I would say, well, look, we're lowering the marginal rates, and that's really what we need to do. What was your second priority? I have one four Spending. three down. Okay. <laughs> Spending. All right. Was, you uh, yeah, my, my four priorities were constituent service, spending, tax reform, um, I think regulatory reform, and then trust, so maybe they're five now. Okay. They're growing. They're evolving. <laughs> uh, with regard to uh, issues of defense, certainly that has come up in terms of uh, the president has been criticized for uh, his action in Libya and inaction in Syria. Um, what uh, role or what kind of advice or what kind of role could you play in terms of uh, uh, helping to educate the president, and certainly, uh, I, I don't know how involved you were in foreign affairs, but... Uh, I, I was never involved, that involved in foreign affairs. I was very involved with defense, and there's a difference. I mean, I was involved with the, the Department of Defense and National Security Strategy, but there's, there's, a, there's a separation between that and then your, your foreign policy. Um, they're certainly not separated, but there's, a, there, there's one. There's, you know, one is State Department, one is defense, and there, there's a difference between them. Um, so I, I was not that involved on the, the foreign affairs side of things, but I, I do think that we need to... We as the United States are the go-to nation for you know, 
and, and have been in the world for good. And I think that we need to continue to, to be that way. And I, and I feel very strongly that we are. So if there's you know an earthquake somewhere, you know if there's a tsunami, you know we're we're the people who people, folks turn to because we have the capability to help out. Um, that's one of the reasons I don't like debt because it ties our hands there. I mean, the more debt we have, the fewer options we have. And I think that the, you look at the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of the Department of Defense have both said that debt is our biggest national security threat because it ties the hands of the Pentagon and what they can respond to. So whether it's a, a terrorist attack, whether it's aggression from a foreign nation, um, we're not going to be able to respond as if as we would like to if we have so much debt. So that's um, going back to to foreign affairs, I, I think that we need. Um, I think we need to be able to project strength, and I think that by projecting strength, you keep yourself safe. You know, the national security of finance and debt is, is really interesting, and it's come up at this summit uh, in, in Mexico right now mm -hmm. with regard to European nations and the IMF. The United States is not looking to increase its IMF contribution, um, and the question is one of you know how do you stimulate an economy? Is it through just you know deregulating? Uh, getting rid of more taxes, certainly that's the Rick Scott approach, for example, or is it investing the Keynesian approach and investing millions, even billions of dollars into the economy? Where do you fall on that? I, I don't think, I, I'm not a Keynesian at all. Um, I, I don't think it worked. Uh, I, we look at what we did uh, with the stimulus bill. Uh, we spent $826 billion, and I, you know, the economy's uh, still stagnant, and we're $826 billion more in debt. So I, I don't think that that was the right, right approach to take. Uh, we fought uh, actually pretty hard against that. Uh, what we would like to see is... Um, tax certainty. That's one thing that's going to help businesses grow. Right now there's a lot of capital sitting on the sidelines. People don't want to invest because they don't know what to expect. We extend everything in a six-month bite or a two-year bite or a one-year bite. And if you're a business and you want to hire um, or invest or buy new equipment or capital, you don't want to do it because you don't know where, where the federal government's going to be. So I think that that's, that's my approach would be much more on the revenues on the tax reform side than on the spending side. And I think we need to cut spending. I need, we need to show our creditors we're serious. We were downgraded last August. I mean, no one talks about that. You know, it's just amazing. That's embarrassing. And, and the only reason people aren't talking about it is because the rest of the world's in such bad shape. And, and that's not something to be proud of. Talk to us about uh, immigration uh, issues and reform. The president just signed this executive order that would shield depending on the estimate, from 800,000 to 1.4 million illegal immigrants uh, from being deported. Um, do you agree with that action, and what should we do about immigration? No, no I don't agree with the action at all. I think if, if you want to change the immigration law, change the immigration law, but don't try and do it a backdoor action through, through an executive order. Um, our laws right now are pretty good, and, and the problem is our laws are good, but they're not enforced. Uh, you know, I was talking to Don Hunter, who's a, uh, he's a police chief down in Marco, but he was the sheriff, and, um, in Collier County, and he told me that 24% of their prison population in Collier County is illegals who um, have a recidivism rate, you know, something like, I think, the you know, five felonies and seven misdemeanors on average f for folks who have been reincarcerated. These people ought to be shipped back, and they're not. And the reason they're not is because ICE doesn't want to do it because they're told not to do it. That's crazy. We have laws on the books. If we'd enforce our laws, we probably wouldn't be in bad shape. Um, and the first thing we have to do is seal the border, and we don't. And we, and why we don't is beyond me. And we need more boots on the ground uh, in the in the southwest to help folks there uh, be able to deal with it. I also think um, on the legal immigration side of things, we're we're a nation of immigrants. You know, we need to figure out better legal immigration so that we have a good guest worker program, so we have a good H H one B or H two B visa program where we bring people to this country, they're educated, and we send them home. That doesn't make any sense. Why don't we bring them to this country, educate them, and then let them invest in this country and use their, their capital to grow and be entrepreneurial the way our grandparents and great-grandparents did? Because that's what makes America great. Now, I just want to be sure that this is clear on the record. You are not correlating the children who were brought here um, with no choice in the matter, who are illegal immigrants, uh, really against their will, with the prisoners in Collier County. No, I, okay. I, no, I just I don't. wanted to make it clear. <laughs> no, that, I, I, I don't that. think. No, I, I, my response to um, David's question about the president's executive orders, I don't think it's legal, and I think that the, we have laws on the books now that, that we ought to enforce. And, and giving an executive order to go around those laws doesn't make sense. If you don't like the law, change the law. That's my response. 